Hi, and welcome to Deep Dialogues, 12 extraordinary conversations I'm having with amazing female soul stewards who at this time are transmitting their unconditional love, empathy and compassion about the creation of a new level of living and therefore helping us to form ideas about a brave new world that we can create together. Have a wonderful time listening in. So, Dr. Jean Houston, we are live. And firstly, to you, thank you so much now that we are surrounded by the assembled company. Lots and lots and lots of people are tuning in. Thank you so much for coming forth to be with us today. This is an absolute joy, such a joy, such a joy. Um, so, and welcome to all of the wonderful people who are tuning in. I can see there are hundreds of people here, expectant and with bated breath for this wonderful, wonderful conversation that we're going to have. So as usual, I would like to pay our wonderful guest absolute honor by just giving you a little bit of information about who she is. And just a little bit of information because this is a lady of vast capacity, <laughs> as I was discovering so fully yesterday in our conversation. But however, for those of you who don't know, Jean Houston, is a renowned philosopher, a human potential expert, and a mythologist. Now, Jean has authored many bestsellers, and one of them in particular, I am devouring at the moment, The Passion of Osiris and Isis. And has, Jean has aided indigenous people in the preservation of their cultures through wonderful organizations around the world, and has garnered, therefore, much acclaim. Now, Dr. Houston is also the co-director of the Foundation for Mind Research and the founder of the Mystery School based on the principles of spiritual wisdom and sacred psychology within the ancient mystery traditions, particularly in the telling of stories and other forms of creativity that illuminate the conviction and power of the soul within the experience of the human odyssey. Jean is a very remarkable individual on this level. So welcome, Jean. And to start our conversation, I would love your perception on the substance of um, the periodicity of what we're experiencing in relation to what we were suggesting yesterday as a time of great renaissance and how this period configures with other historic periods of Renaissance. And we were particularly yesterday mentioning the, the substance of the Italian Renaissance. And of course, you've brought up the wonderful inspiration of Petrarch. So I wonder if you could share with us what you perceive to be the configurations that are similar. Mm -hmm. Well, Petrarch was a fascinating Italian ambassador who went around to the monasteries of Europe uh, into their libraries, stealing ancient texts <laughs> to trying to put uh, Aristophanes and Euripides back together again. And uh, he always had a yearning to climb a very great mountain called Mont Ventoux. And it was a very windy place. And they said, don't go, you'll be blown off. He said, well, I, I have to go. He climbed up to the top and he looked out and there were the hills of Italy and there was the Mediterranean and there was the Rhone Valley and there was Europe, you know, just right in front of him. And then he felt this enormous need to close his eyes and reflect on inner things. And he did. And then he felt drawn to look outside, and there it was. It was, a, 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 you know, the, the Alps. And, it, and then he felt the inside, and he went inside, and, and, and there was a vast inscape landscape of images from his past. And it was as if his soul had become incarnate. Mm. And he pulled mm. out a, a little book he was reading, which was the Confessions of St. Augustine, opened up to anywhere, and he said... Men travel everywhere to see great mountains, mighty rivers, and then in Latin, sere lenquas e ipsos, they pass themselves by. And he thought, that's what's happened. Mm. And he realized his inner space was filled with soul and was larger than even the outer space. Mm. Inner space, outer space. That to me was the launching 100 years before it officially mm. began of mm. the Renaissance. 
mm. where suddenly our inner perception became so large. You look mm. at someone mm. like Leonardo da Vinci, who was very accustomed to explore the hues and the levels and the gradations of his own psyche. Mm. And mm. then he applied it to designing perspectives in machines. Perspectives would, and then with that, that went out all over Europe. And before you not, you had machines, you had the printing press, you had uh, ways of being able to create from new levels of perspective. Mm. It changed mm. painting. It changed music. Music became uh, polyphonic, polyphonies, mm. different mm. gradations, and music became spatial. Uh, Galileo, uh, Copernicus, Kepler, discovering the perspectives of outer space with uh, the telescope. Um, the gentleman in, in Holland, Leeuwenhoek, perspectives mm -hmm. in small spaces with the microscope. Mm -hmm. Vesalius, the perspectives of the body. Um, Michelangelo, perspective created ellipses in architecture. All of this was going on in such a way that Shakespeare could actually say of it, who was also late Renaissance, and we were, you were quoted before, what a piece of work. What were you just recording at what Renaissance? What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. The beauty so again, of it's perspective, isn't it? Yes, it's a whole, it's a radical form of perspective, and that, of course, was the summation of the Renaissance. How like a god. Now, where are we now? We have the perspectives of the Hubble telescopes, and we're seeing the universe. We have the perspectives of the inner, inner scopes, and we see how we are made of the design of the cosmos itself. And above all, we realize we are the cosmos. We are cosmomimetic. We are, mm -hmm. we don't just live in the universe, but the universe lives in us. I mean, the whole psychological revelation of uh, a man like Einstein, who I met, by the way, when I was eight years old, uh, you know, who, who really saw the relationship between inner and outer space, and that we are we are bio, you know, we are God's things, stuff, God's stuff filled into this biodegradable space-time suit, do you know? Mm -hmm. And that's been a lot of my work, and that's been the inspiration of the, mm -hmm. my work and also the fact that I helped create two universities, you know, out of this. With, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, okay. mm -hmm. But the, we, we do know that once we really change the understanding of how we are possessed with the soul of reality itself. And we are paragons of, of the sameness with the universal stuff. Then we move into a new direction. Now, renaissances seem to always occur after everything breaks down in times of radical breakdown or dislocation. Uh, the renaissance was preceded by what? The Black Death took out half half of Europe, 100 million people, gone. Um, what did this do? Well, you didn't have a lot of slaves around. First people, five you know, people to take care of you. So the, the former farmers became merchants. The merchants became noblemen. The noblemen just sort of went elsewhere. And we had also a, a revolution in space, Vasco da Gama, Maged Magellan, Columbus, intercontinental space, but also intracontinental space with someone like, for example, Leonardo da Vinci, who plumbed the, the, the globe, the earth of himself, mm. not just in, in terms of space, but in terms of time. Mm. We know from quantum physics that time is multidimensional. Time past, time present, time future are going on simultaneous. It is not this linear equation. So this got me going with my husband, uh, my late husband, Robert Masters, exploring intercontinental space in our own time and discovering that we have barely begun to touch the surface of who and what we really are. And I believe that if we talk about ways to get beyond the pandemics, which are horrendous, the mm. breakdowns of cultures and societies, the mm. breakdowns of relationship. This always is what portends this time of darkness 
an epidemic is what portends the coming of rinascita, rebirth, mm. renaissance. Mm. So I ask you, sir, you know, mm. with the fact that you have explored in depth the tenor, the nature of so many lives, mm. what do you see of renaissance emerging? Well, my mind immediately turns to this period of transcendence that already, although we're seeing in a very earthy context, that there are many challenges upon our, upon our earth, within our earth, and also within the earth of our beings. But at the same time, you see the inspiration that I gain through what you've just shared with us, and in response to the question that you've just asked me, that I, I have my eye on the wonder that you're talking of in relation to Petrarch's vision that he was actually seeing this vast cosmological landscape represented within the paradise nature of the Gaia yes. and see, seeing a way of being able to read the inner folds of his own creativity. And so I know that we're going to be leading our conversation towards the nature of transcendence, but it seems to me that the, the vital qualities in our behavior, because it, what I've, one of the crucial things that I've learned is that feeling is the language of the soul. And that if we're actually engaging in the wonder and the awe and the joy of creation, we are inspirationally uplifted beyond the flotsam and the jetsam of the horror that's going around. Not that that's actually being in any way irresponsible, because of course we need to be responsible. But how can we do this if we're in the, the, the maya of of desperation, what we firstly need to do is, I feel, see infinity, and then begin to dispatch the wisdoms, the finite processes that we can feel in 3D. So that's where I would begin. The mire of, the mire of Maya. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Oh, it's indeed. all Maya, it's all part of the same big yeah. illusion, you know. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and it was, uh, it was a wonderful quote that I wanted to share with you because I, I know that we, in our conversation yesterday, were wanting to share the nature of expanding domains, yes. to use your phrase. And there was a quote from Robert Schwartz's book, Your Soul's Gift, that I thought was quite interesting for and germane to what we're discussing. The spirit of humanity is called upon to heal the wounds that centuries of fear struggle and separation have caused. The crises humanity is facing are to be solved not by the inventions of mind alone, like the new technologies, but by awakening of the heart, and therefore awakening the heart one human at a time. How, how, do you, how do you feel about the expanding domains as being, you know, one of the lines that I know that um, Marianne and I were discussing is that the era of data collection is virtually over, meaning, of course, it's not over. We're always going to be accumulating more information because we have gymnastic mental bodies that love to um, vault all, over all sorts of uh, opinions and theses. But... Um, at the same time to come back down to earth of how we can actually see that what we really need to concentrate on today are the behaviors of our peoples yes, because yes. these seem to be awry yes, yes. well i think surely we're living in the time in which the reset button of history has been hit and i look at what is unusual what is radical that has never really been there in any major way and mm -hmm. it is not the mechanism and the technology that is the expected domain. Mm -hmm. No, it's the rise of women mm -hmm. to full partnership with men over the whole domain of human affairs, mm -hmm. history, herstory. But also when you look at what do women have that men do not tend to adapt to, and that is um, the emphasis is on process rather than on product, mm -hmm. on making things cohere, develop, grow, the relational dynamic between things and beings. Mm -hmm. And this then short circuits a great deal of prejudice, <laughs> mm -hmm. of ancient archaic modes of thinking, uh, hierarchies. I mean, it just, and th this is happening. It's happening 
everywhere. It's happening subtly, so as not to offend the men too much, but it is happening. And with that, I think when you have this something that we are seeing truly in this century, the rise of women to full partnership with men in the whole domain of human affairs, you have something extraordinary. I mean, you look at what are the countries, the seven countries that are working very well within the pandemic, and they're all run by women. What does this say? Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. The emphasis, again, is on the process, not on the Mm product. The emphasis on every person being acknowledged as whole, as sacred. When you see the sacred in the other, there is then in that presencing that occurs between you and he or you and she, there occurs a transmutation, a new kind of alchemy of healing, because it is a healing that is a holing. I mean, this would be a major way, not only in terms of personal healing, but also cultural, intercultural healing. One of the reasons that I got sent to so many countries, <coughs> all told about 109, mm-hmm. something like 1958, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. was because they, I was asked back because, well, sister, she sees us whole. She sees us, she asks us, she learns from us. <coughs> That's why we want her back. <coughs> Even while saying that, the old lady might be rubbing away on my skin to see how to get rid of this awful white stuff and get to real color. But at the same time, you know, <clears throat> knowing that I knew that she was whole and holy. Mm-hmm. It, it is a shift. It is, a, it is almost a, if we talk about the internal global awareness, it's the awareness of the fullness of the other, the holiness, the sacrality of the other, that then causes a very subtle movement in the realms of the psyche and people begin to grow. Or so I find that that is true. Mm. And that is the great gift of women because they've had to do that in order to get their kids to grow. Yeah, to yeah, grow. yeah. But now it's and the deeper sacred strand, the sacred psychology of it all. And so in this moment, as you express this, I'm reminded of the, the nature of the reverence the reverence of life and how behaviorally during Renaissance period that we would always grant the person before us with reverence, which generally speaking, as we know, was measured as the bow from the gentleman and the curtsy from the lady. And, um, uh, And how we've forgotten the mindfulness and the presence of regarding whomever we are meeting with that degree of reverence. Except, of course, we have this interesting game today of namaste, which more and more people are using. So I guess the, the, the venture and the invention of reverence is really being remembered through that mm-hmm. gesture. Yes, it is. Because in our conversation, I'm sure you are as well, I'm really interested in finding ways of being able to ground the loftiness of our stories into genuine acts of formidable behavior that will be able to change the landscape of our world so that there is more grace, that there is more charity, that there is more reverence, and there is more love and joy on our planet in these times of such devastating... Devastation, which could be ending times. I think there is a line somewhere in T.S. Eliot where one is at a bar late at night and they yell, it's closing time. And it is closing time of all the things that you just mentioned. But it's also opening times. I mean, for what? I'm just thinking as you're saying. Yes. Uh, we're in the time of the potential regeneration of what it is to be human, mm. the really possible human who can create the possible world. Mm. And of course, that's been my view for you know donkey years. Yeah. Uh, when you look at the expansion of the extension of the senses, of the embodiment, of the holy, of of uh, the ways of using the brain mind system, which of course goes throughout the whole body mind differently. I've never met a stupid child. I've met incredibly stupid systems of education. To take education itself, when education is hands-on, sensory rich, and the child is learning with the whole body and mind, they do not fail. So part of my work has been to help schools around the world get rid of, excuse me, the bad 19th century British education, 
which the Brits, you know, yeah. foisted on people. Mm. Oh, but, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> but, but, but also to have education that educates the whole body mind of the child. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's one thing, the regeneration of human nature from what we <clears throat> know that who we are and what we yet can be. A second yeah. would be the recreation of societies that are now global mm -hmm. and yet can, can find, just like with the child, find their own unique culture and genius and preserve it. That was a lot of my work around the world, helping cultures preserve the genius of their culture. While at the same time, being global without being uh, having a Western sensibility imposed on them. So the regeneration of societies with women and men in equal positions, otherwise we're out of here. And then of course, the breakdown of the membrane, the breakdown of the membrane between cultures. Look at the new music, which has so many different instruments and melodies that are so very different that shake up. Look at food. I mean, you go down a street in Melbourne, Australia, and there is a, <clears throat> Chinese Peruvian food, <laughs> so the mix and match here is uh, Nor Norwegian, Italian. I mean, the very fact that the, the tongue is already a map of the world, mm. you know, that's why, you know, Korean food does not taste anything like French food because it is affecting different uh, agendas on the tongue, different things. Well, with this world cuisine, this world music, we are being shift shaped, ship shaped, you know, and shifted into whole different domains of capacity and understanding. Now that's just one thing, the breakdown of the membrane, but it's also the breakdown of the membrane between ourselves and all our other selves. We are not we are not encapsulated bags of skin dragging around dreary little ego. Ego is but one image among the multiple images of the human psyche. And when you really, so for example, I use myself as an exemplum horrible. I hate and detest to write, but I have 33 published books and a whole lot of unpublished. I hate to write, but I happen to be a very, very good cook. And the reason I'm such a good cook is because my mother, whose name was Maria Nunziata, Serafina Graziella, Fiorina Perpetua Tudara, born in Syracuse, Sicily, marries Jack Houston of Texas. They loathed each other's food. My father was like, oh, Mary, that, that, those are stink buds you got in there. Those terrible, that's what the old witch women down in Texas wore around their neck to fight off the run at you. Jack, it's just good garlic, old Italian dishes. Anyway, to make them stay together, I became the world's first fusion cook, making chicken fried polenta, you know, and things like that. But the point is, as a cook, I have no blocks. As a writer, I am horrendously blocked. And so and I stir what in... Are, and what writing. are those blocks, do you feel? I mean, in terms of the writing. Well, just, I mean, well, anybody head listening head. who's read you will think, what? What is this? So yes, tell us... You don't know that I'm cooking up ideas. I'm yeah. Adding, yeah. adding, you know, the spices of different associations. I'm mm. adding... I'm stirring in a melange of, mm. of perspectives. Mm. I mm. literally am thinking as a cook. Now, the thing is... If I were to say to you, Stuart, <clears throat> do you have any block about any kind of, I mean, within decent range of anything that you have difficulty doing, but you have to do? Numbers. I'm profoundly numerically dyslexic. All right. So you're dyslexic, which is just a, I sometimes think diagnosis is the psychiatric form of character assassination. <laughs> <laughs> So for, me, for me, it was the sa saving grace because <laughs> automatically it provided an identification of a malaise, um, a, a, a challenge that nobody could understand. And okay. suddenly and there was, there was liberation part. within the diagnosis. Got it. It's great. But what is, what is your highest quality, would you say, like mine was being a cook? I would say soaring through the cosmos with exquisite language. So it's a language. But so you, know, language. you know, Jean, it's my, my linguistic skills, which people comment on. I just use words to address what I see. But that came through a love of sound. Mm. 
Okay. And two years of self-muting between my seventh and eighth year, because I was speaking about what I was seeing, and I soon discovered that what I was mm. seeing was not being seen by other people. And so rather than being constantly placed under gross disapprobation, which then of course meant that one was hit, one was punished by a stick, I chose to shut up, which gave me the liberality of being able to really listen. Very good. You see, and then you could use words like ones, and you became an alchemist of words. You became a magus of speech. Yeah. yeah. A so you didn't ever even have speech. to look yeah. at numbers because numbers were to themselves with very little. <laughs> well, you know, the resolution came later through poetry mm -hmm. beca because of rhythm. And then in delving into Shakespeare's wonder and magic, why do these words in their correlation appear to be foreign to many listeners today? And yet, when we created Shakespeare's Globe Theatre, that most of our audience were foreign nationals who were drawn by the vibration of the oh. rhythm and the sound in rhythm. So I began to realize that the, 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 during the Renaissance period, the, the reason for why rhythm became so pronounced, both in terms of the speaking of verse mm. and of social dance, because they were so much more in connection with the anima, uh, in connection with the anima mundi, but that they use numbers to order the chaos. They order, they order the chaos of the muchness. Isn't that extraordinary? And that was, that was a point of alleviation for me. So it meant that I could actually engage in rhythm to quantify, in the, you know, as a young adult, in the way that I couldn't as a child. If only that had been explained to me when I was five or six through social dance, it would have been much easier. But then you would not have gotten to the place where you are now, where you are using words as ones. Mm. Yeah, and well, thank you and magic, yes. You mentioned Wordsworth, yes, just a moment ago? No, no, no. Funny, I heard you mention Wordsworth. So it must be something Wordsworth. Mm -hmm. What is Wordsworth mm -hmm. trying to say? Wait a minute, let me just find out, because it came out of nowhere. About ah, There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every sight, to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream, Childish immortality of intimations in early child, and yeah. then he complains. Things are not as they are, as they were. Go yeah. where where I may for night or day. The things that I used to see, I see no more. And that is what happens when schooling collapses the the vibrational genius of the child. That's why we have to put poetry back into schools. And plays. I mean, that's one of the things I've done in my life is help create new schools where poetry, where theater is central to education. Because if you are incarnating an idea, as in happened in Shakespeare's school, where they 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 played Caesar and Cassius and all of that, they played, and then by in the playing, you then incarnated not just the word, but the whole feeling, living form of the hero or the great character, you mm. see. Mm. But put theater and poetry back in Children Grove. Mm. And mm. also a great deal of hands-on sensory rich forms, you know. Yes. Well, there, there are, of course, as, yeah. as you know, because you're involved in a number of very significant projects where this is taking place. <clears throat> but we are, we are few in the expression of the metaphoric consciousness. And yet there are these projects that are being stimulated by wonderful young people, whether it's to do with the, the rhythm of the so-called ghetto in relation to rap yes, or other yeah. forms. The way it's been. And I'm working with a project in the East End of London here where there is a high school. <clears throat> each child is given the right of oracy. In other words, where they're allowed to discover their voices in the meaningful expression of their inner world. So they are always honored, they are always revered in a classroom situation when there is something that they need to express about the way that they perceive the inner landscape or the outer landscape of their growing consciousness. And they call it oracy, stimulated by two extraordinary men 
who were initially politicians uh, working for Tony Blair. And then after his regime were evidently so dispirited <laughs> that they moved in the direction of education and went back and trained as qualified teachers and then used this inspirational platform for this furtherance. So there is, there is a growth, but at the same time, I know that there's a momentary lamentation in the way that we, we don't often hear the great words of the great poets being remembered or refreshed within the minds of our, of our peers. Expanding dom domains is really the theme of what we're touching into, which is a Renaissance concept, isn't it? Yes, it is. And what, what do you feel in your infinite wisdom? What do you feel would be the major pointers of today in the sense of what can we immediately, what can our listeners immediately connect with that they can change their own behaviors radically to embrace the expanding domains that we're referring to within the Renaissance mind? All right, here, here's a simple exercise. <clears throat> we will assume the expanded domain, mm -hmm. which I will call what Plato called the eidos, the divine idea. He said everything had a divine idea, the eidos. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of ourselves as well. I have never met anyone with whom I have not experienced that there was a larger eidos of a, a, a coding to them. And so, may I give a very quick little exercise? Of, let's do it, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. People just rub their hands together and put them out away from the screen. I mean, or don't look at the screen. <clears throat> and I want you to imagine, and for the next few seconds, just accept it as true that standing opposite you is your idols, your divine idea, your optimal pattern, your optimal template. This is filled with so many different capacities, enchantments, but this optimal pattern, this idols, this divine self of you is looking on you with so much love, with so much admiration, and you feel yourself charged and and activated and called into being and, and loved, loved so much. Oh, knows it knows your bummers and your follies, but that's all right, that goes with being human. But beyond and deeper than that is this divinity that is you. And if you would practice this every day and know that the divine idea of you is your great friend, is there as your companion on life's journey, and you can turn to this great being, this Eidos, who is part of the cosmic agenda of you, part of a different destiny, a higher form, and also completely satisfied with where you are now. But you can feel yourself evoked, <clears throat> honored, enchanted, enhanced, loved beyond measure, your divine idols, who is now your great companion, should you choose, and is there with you for the rest of your life consciously, if you choose, and you'll find yourself inspired, called forth, given different direction sometimes, or just honored for where you are, but always taken part, taking part in this expanded life for you are needed for these times, be not afraid, dear friends. You are needed for these times, and you have this divine companion who is yourself writ large, who is there to help. And so it is, and so it shall be. <clears throat> and deep breath in, I feel, and then let the breath out. Wow. A complete cellular awakening. And within the context of our conversation, our dialogue, we suddenly feel a huge awakening taking place in 
reminding us of who we truly are and the treasury of vast potentialities that lie within that presumably Petrarch was also beginning to experience as he saw the mm. outer landscape. As you speak of the idos, I'm also reminded of the genie that the Renaissance mind believed in, the guardian angel, the genie, that they believed gave them genius. And so if we were to be enraptured by the possibility of the idos, surrounded by other companions, our guardian angels, that we begin to realize that every single moment of mindfulness is a pledge, an evocation to the reverence of our external and internal divinity. And that it's not we who are creating the great act, whether it be the gesture to one other person as we hold the door open to somebody as they pass through, or something even more profound than that that actually we are merely vessels through which the great divine moves through. Indeed, we, we look within ourselves and we discover we are the divine. We are the universe in miniature. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I think we probe our psyche. And just like Petrarch, we, we discover a creative font of, of images and discover we contain worlds within that are waiting to be born in ourselves. I mean, a renaissance, again, a rebirth, or renascita, occurs not just because of the rising of uh, ancient and archetypal symbols. A renaissance happens because, because there is a rising of the soul. The soul is breached. Mm. It's a wounding, because in this wounding, the psyche is opened up and, and, and new questions, new questions begin to be asked about who are you in your depths? Who are we in our depths? And I think that these powerful questions do not need to lead to alienation and withdrawal, but I think to the seeding of the world with the newly released powers of the psyche, and that's what I see happening in our time. I mean, it's, it's during Renaissance eras that maybe we're seeing the mind of the maker determining that the time is now ready for a major jump in culture, in consciousness. Maybe it's the inserting of social and psychic enzymes, <laughs> you know, to help affect these transitions. You know, mm, mm, mm. so yes, and <laughs> I'm reminded of Noel Coward's reference to those chemical thingamies that mm. are so important as they cascade through our bodies and produce these expanded psychic enzymes. Yeah, not that he used that phrase. <laughs> um, so we're talking really about the as you showed us in the, in, thank you so much for the gift of this wonderful practice that we just engaged in. You're allowing us to see a way of even in the incandescence of intelligent thought, we can experience ourselves as being completely embodied. All we need is that moment where we can actually feel the stillness resonating in the vastness of cosmology. Mm -hmm. So we need to become more present as we embody. Very, very present. Mm. Everything is present. We are local and we are non-local. I mean, maybe Maybe we are, maybe our brain, body, mind, being serves as gates into God, as well as a hologrammatic reducing valve, which, which renders God's stuff into structure and form. I think that what we could be entering into, and this has always been true in a lot of my teaching, is a regular training so that our own reality can become very fluid, moving back and forth between ordinary and extraordinary realities, local and archetypal worlds, implicate, explicate domains. Um, I, I wonder whether most subtle, ephemeral, and unexplained phenomena 
uh, is the phenomena of the entering of ourselves into the non-local reality of which we are a part. Mm. Mm. And that so-called psychic phenomena mm. are only byproducts of this, this simultaneous everywhere, every time matrix. Synchronicities, you know, the, those coincidental uh, occurrences that seem to have a higher design or connectedness, derive from the purposeful patterning, the nature of, of, of reality itself, where everything, regardless of how distant in space and time, is coinciding, you mm. know. Mm. We are quantum people. Mm. Most of us don't bring into consciousness the non-local the God stuff, the universal stuff of which we're a part, but we desperately needs it, need it now to mm -hmm. find our way through these patterns. I have an exercise that I do with people when mm -hmm. they're stuck. I say, imagine that we, we actually live in parallel universes. A lot of quantum physics insists that we do. There are, that we're ubiquitous throughout the cosmos, that there are many, many versions of ourselves. And then I have people travel <laughs> to another version of themselves. And whether it's imaginative or it's imaginal, it's part of the real quaking, rich, feisty nature of reality itself, you know. And they travel and they need a parallel version of themselves who has some kind of quality that they need, who yeah. also you have the quality they need. And I have them exchange the, the, these things and remarkable, remarkable things really begin to happen mm. that were never known before. Mm. I mean, for example, Jennifer, as local Jennifer, had last stage, uh, uh, you know, the little bug, Lyme tick disease. Mm. Mm. She was dying. So mm. I took her to Jennifer Four. Mm. She, she would accept that, who is in perfect health mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. belongs to a culture that is far beyond where we are in terms of natural healing. Mm -hmm. And she could feel herself being imbued with a whole level of health. Mm. Mm. And she gave to Jennifer for the fact that she, Jennifer one was a wonderful orator, some sense of the being an orator. Mm. And mm. within two months, she was completely cured. Wow. Now you'd say yeah. all these things happen. No, they don't just happen. It's that our notion of the way reality works is so narrow, is so puerile compared to what is really out there. Mm. That's why the new physics that I'm working on with our friend, you know, Anna Louise Smithsman, mm. who is really a kind of female Einstein, mm. how do we begin to look at what is implied in the new physics that we are ubiquitous, that there are many variations of ourselves, mm. and then to bring this into our body-mind system and see if, if only by the fascination of the fascinating aspect of feeling ourselves to be related to another version of ourselves gives mm. us the okay to be able to take on a new domain of consciousness of capacity and of abilities that we never thought to have so it might be a psychological trick it may be ourselves playing magus or it may be a reunion with the levels of domains of ourselves that we did not know that we ever had, mm -hmm. you see. So I'm 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 very much into the whole uh, profession of reality shifting, but it comes out of my experience of quantum physics. This brings us to Einstein. Yeah, I have a question that I'd love to ask you, oh. if I may, Please. which is. Um, Dealing with the, the causative nature, the deep nature of what we're discovering about ourselves at this time. If you were given the opportunity to move into the very central aspect of the mind of God, huh? but at the same time, whomever, whichever magus or wizard or witch or shaman you were working with, said you can only use one sense. Which sense would you use? Well, my best sense is taste. Mm. My second best sense is kinesthetic. I mm. was an athlete in my extreme youth. Mm. 
my worst sense is vision. Hmm. I would probably use my worst sense because it would be so much more innocent than my other senses. <laughs> that, is, that is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So um, the substance of innocence, the purity of innocence, this extraordinary virtue illuminates the conviction of your vision. I'm reminded of the Kogi in Colombia, yes. these yes, yes, extraordinary yes. beings. Um, yes. And when the predestined one at the age of seven or eight is discovered with shamanic potential, I think they call themselves, what do they call themselves? The mamas, the shaman, that that child is taken into darkness for 10 years, that they are taught in complete darkness. So they develop the ability of in, inner visioning no. so that when those 10 years have passed and they've been through whatever rites of passage, initiations that they, they go through in their sub rosa culture, that when they come back into the light, that, gosh, what can you imagine the experience after 10 years of complete darkness? Coming back into the light, they're able to see with what's known as, well, what we would call double vision, the inner visioning and the outer visioning. Mm, mm, mm. Yes. And inner, inner, the celebration of innocence is one of their greatest graces. I think, you know, in, in, in our experience of them, the, that makes complete sense, doesn't it? In the sense of the Kogi have a level of purity, yes, yes. which is very childlike in its innocence. You know, I'm familiar in South America, especially of societies like the Ghana, the Ghana where, that, where these kinds of practices grow out of a state of innocence. And yet, my friend, and yet, we humans are not alone as we face the massive transition that is upon us. We are, we are embedded in a larger ecology of being, aren't we? Mm -hmm. It's motive, motive force uh, arising right now from the planet, which is in such trouble, and the universe. Uh, it, asking us to be innocent of where we were and where we are and inviting us into a new stage of growth. And we're waking up to the realization that we can become, and this is the new innocence, partners in creation, mm -hmm. stewards of mm -hmm. the earth's well-being and conscious participants in the cosmic epic of a whole new order of evolution. I mean, the ancient peoples that you speak of, they've always known that the story is so much bigger than all of us, but it desires our engagement, our love, and our commitment. And what happens with these, these societies, which I'm familiar with and have worked with in different times, is that they do have a state of emptying out everything that they knew <laughs> mm. and becoming available in the great silence to everything that is. Mm. And maybe in our quarantining, Worldwide, that's something that is happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I'm right, but I know I, this is... I pray so, and I know, I know that thought is something that you're propagating, because we touched on it yesterday. But the global pause, rather than the lockdown, has yeah. provided us with this deep, blissful listening to the Divine Mother, and that yeah. her conversation is very, very alerted. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I've been gifted with is the honor and the ability to tune people into their note. Ah. And, and in, in this moment, I'm reminded of, and of course, the majority, of, the majority of us not living in our notes because we're living in our heads rather than our bodies. I'm reminded of uh, meeting Maladoma Somme and his story of his peoples, of how that when a, when a woman was about to bring forth child, she would be taken by her sisters into the bush where they would sit in silence until they heard the note of the child. And then they would sound the note of the child yes. and the child would be quickened within her womb. So they would oh. either escort her or carry her back into 
the community and then she would begin her childbirth and they would be around her singing the note of the child. I've done this at three birthings. The cervix dilates to such an extent that the child just comes winging out. <laughs> um, and the story goes that, um, and then during each rite of passage, the child and therefore the young adult, and then eventually the adult would be reminded of their note. And if anybody, perpetrated a misdemeanor, whether they'd lied or stolen or were still committed murder, that they were placed in the center of the circle of the tribe and the tribe would sound their note back to them so that they could be reminded of who they truly were rather than what they had become. Hmm. So the, pur the purity of the innocence leads us to a flight of fancy that opens the doorway or the gateway of the imaginal. And so as a result of that, we are communicated to by the unseen beings that we know are sacred and have immense divine teachings for us at this time. Um, and this is why meditation at this time or soulful practices like the one that you shared with us is so crucial, isn't it? And I know you live on a mountain, and the mountain, I'm sure, is speaking to you as, as you journey back into your house from whatever part of the world that you've been stretching yourself to and creating wonders. But as you go back, the mountain speaks to you. It does. Mm. You know, in different states of consciousness, I like living on a mountain, we can be brought to subtle levels of the mind that expand to certain states of interacting with the universe itself. So I go out from my mountain at night in the time of the great stars, you know, and I feel myself to be in a state of interdependent co-arising with the universe itself. With me, it's meditation or contemplation, but it could easily be the other realm of experience of rapture, ecstasy, loving, uh, high creativity. But whatever the state is, these are states that we are given that we have in ourselves, which give us access to the depth, the dynamic levels of mind and spirit that under the unbounded field of awareness Mm. Mm. of the universal field of consciousness itself mm. Mm. that has many more capacities than those operating in local consciousness. So this is right now my big interest. To how do I teach or train or evoke in people that unbounded field of consciousness that can take us to the places of deep seeing, of solution, of the deepest values, of the deepest purpose of the deepest patterns for life, of the richest potentials for experience, the potential codings, codings for experience. Mm. Because mm. within the level of creative patterns, I'm not, I'm not, not unlike the platonic forms, mm. you find the, wherever it comes from, from all over the universe, we have access, the great ideas, the, the innovative actions become manifest. Now, I certainly have seen these with meditators, with mystics, with high creatives who more readily see these, these potential entry points into the larger universe. Mm -hmm. And they return full of potential and creative ideas. In some cases, way, 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 way beyond anything that they would ordin ordinarily exist or feel in. And thus, they then drop in an idea, or better, it's more than an idea, it's a flavor that, that sets up reverberations mm -hmm. which then come into the form of the things intended mm -hmm. from another source, a cosmic consciousness. Mm -hmm. When we bring our local consciousness, and you, Stuart, know about this so well, when you bring your local consciousness into a higher resonance, you access news from the universe. Mm -hmm. And this is the timeless, spaceless, polydimensional reality mm -hmm. 
which you do not enter into when you are caught up with ego needs. Mm. Mm. And so, and, and the constant yeah. complex of doing, 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 doing. Would you revere that at least once a year, perhaps twice a year, that we should make pilgrimage to a sacred space? Oh yes, I do that with my students, or I did before we mm. were all shut down. <laughs> but mm. we always went to sacred spaces mm. all around the world every year, and. It certainly gives us back the juice of our own becoming. What I find with ritual in <laughs> sacred space is that it illuminates and amplifies in a stillness. Doesn't but it? Yes. After the action. After the action itself. There because is ritual provide. itself comes from the Sanskrit, rita, rita, art, discipline, the dance, that which illumines our transitions, so that after the ritual, you are in the place of availability to your mm -hmm. own transition, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A time will come very soon for a collective pilgrimage. Okay. As, we give, as we give thanks for the release of the coronavirus. Which may be what it takes to release the coronavirus. Indeed. Indeed. And if we were in other kinds of societies that we've been referring to, that's what they would be doing. Yeah. They would also already be having rituals of the release. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. And so as an evocation for all of these wonderful people listening in, who, by the way, in the chat box are leaving beautiful statements like, I love listening to Jean, um, and wonderful people coming through and, are, and saying all sorts of things, which I, unfortunately I can't read very clearly because of the screen, um, that there is a quest for us, you know, to embrace um, the wonder of the expanding domains, parallel, parallel universes, parallel timelines, that if our immediate circumstances are not necessarily showing the great dream that we're dreaming into existence, which is the land of milk and honey, which is the paradise that we see, full of love, full of truth, full of grace, full of humility, full of innocence, that we need to keep believing in the vision by creating it in a parallel universe so that we know as soon as this takes place that the space-time continuum distorts and the parallel universes become one and we travel through in in flesh as well as etherically that this will be a great quest very good because the divine the divine creative imagination which is what i think you're also talking about yeah. is the yeah. Through which God or cosmic mind or the universe imagines this world into being. We live in a universe of open ended potential at each and every moment. We are partners in imagination, we are partners in what is getting dreamed up. And how the universe manifests mm -hmm. depends on how we both individually and, as you say, ritually, collectively choose to experience it. The power is in the viewing as viewed so appears as padma sambhava said in the eighth century as viewed so appears and that is part of the the critical part of imagination again i return to my experience of einstein when i was eight years old mm. when one of our kids in the class, third grade or whoever it was mm. said mr einstein how can we get to be as smart as you and he he said ah read fairy tales we didn't like that answer at all and then another smart aleck kid, well, Mr. Einstein, how can we get to be smarter than you? Ah, read more fairy tales. And I got to talk to him for a few moments afterwards. And he said, it's imagination. He said, everybody thinks I'm a mathematician. No, I get the students to do that. What I am is I am imaginative. And I ride the light beam. And so he entered into co-partnership with the universe and came through with such beauty, do you know? Mm. But that's what it was about. That yeah. was probably one yeah. of the teachings yeah. I have. Had. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I love this story when you tell it. And of course, for, for our ears, there's a very distinct difference between imagination and fantasy. Oh, yes. And that the fantasy is really the 
the, the pollution of the egoic mind trying to assert itself on the extraordinary field of the imagination to construct realities. Well, Kant, purely... Kant talked about the difference between reap, oh golly, I'm trying to remember, productive imagination, which was deep imagination, Mm. And reproductive imagination, where we just took this and that and sort of mm. slammed it together into fantasy. But mm. the productive mm. imagination, then uh, you, you talked about your loving, uh, your loving uh, uh, Blake, mm. who said, uh, eternity is in love with the productions of time. Mm. And that's the imagination. Eternity mm. is in love with the production. <laughs> I think that is what so what's beautiful, and unfortunately, our time is coming to a point of completion for this particular conversation. And um, there, there, yes, I, I wish I could read more of these statements that people are scribbling away. Um, we've actually, what, <laughs> what, sorry? What are they saying? I, I, I would love to be able to read it, but I can't read it clearly because the screen is not permitting me to read it. In the chat screen? Do something with this. It's the chat box, yes. Let me see if I can just extend the screen slightly. Ah, oh, now I can see it more clearly. Um, well, a lot of people are saying yes, bravo. Somebody's Oxlip Music saying bravo, how wonderful. Um, by the way, for all those people who are listening in, this is the wonderful Dr. Jean Houston. Um, it was the 19th century Prussian school system, which is present in education, out of date now. Lots of people, I don't know what that means. And blah, 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 blah. I too have a passion for the sound of words. Words are the music. Well, words anchor states, of course. So lots of people agreeing with us. And um, there's a wonderful David Maddy is talking about wands and wands were, words were, wordsmiths and wands and exemplary. Act. So any questions being asked? Um, I don't see any questions. However, there is some wonderful, if there's anything significant, I will, of course, relay it to Jean later. Jean, it seems, luxurious conversation, says Dirish, a wonderful, <laughs> so we're being, we're being, you're being complimented, my darling. Thank you, everybody. Uh, you're very it, kind. <laughs> indeed. Um, it seems that effortlessly we've reached the pathway of transcendence without even mentioning it. So that's great fun. I think we're complete. Because after all, you know, as we, when we were planning the possible route of our conversation yesterday, knowing that it would be completely extemporized, that we would reach a point of transcendence. And Well, as the poet mm -hmm. says, la commedia è finita. <laughs> finita. Si. So uh, for all of you, on behalf of all of you, to this wonderful, wonderful... Um, wordsmith and thought wizard that we have had. Thank you so much. And I hope that we can meet again in this context and celebrate these, the wonders of these thoughts in all sorts of different ways. And for all of you listening in, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I look forward to seeing what you're going to be writing further. <laughs> Hopefully you have beautiful quests that you'll be able to muster. Um, so I'm going to say goodbye to all those people listening in.